Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Okay, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute um, this afternoon for our, our book event. Uh, I'm Ryan Streeter. I'm happy to welcome you today. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at AEI, and I'm especially pleased to be able to uh, do this introduction for this book event today on Naomi Schaefer Riley's new book, No Way to Treat a Child, um, because uh, having had the pleasure of being Naomi's colleague for the last few years here at AEI, I've been able to benefit from the book being sort of written over time and getting brief um, by Naomi along the way. And if you've ever spent any time in state government, um, like I have, had the privilege to work for a governor, you realize just how absolutely critical these issues are and the intersection between government dysfunction, um, family dysfunction, and, and trouble in our communities kind of comes in full force in the Child Protective Services. And so it's, it's uh, way past time for a book like Naomi's to have been written. If you don't know Naomi Schaefer Riley, she's a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute where she specializes in Child Protective Services, foster care systems, and in particular, the role of non-government actors like faith-based and civic organizations role uh, in changing these systems on the ground. She's the author of six books. Uh, you may have seen them, you may have read some of them. Uh, they include Be the Parent, Please, Stop Banning Seesaws, and Start Banning Snapchat. We tried that at home. And Till Faith Do Us Part, How Interfaith Marriage is Transforming America. You know Naomi is a former columnist and a frequent contributor to many of the papers that you read. Um, we're joined today as well by Emily Yaffe, who is uh, a journalist and a contributor at The Atlantic. Uh, she was previously a longtime contributor to Slate and its Dear Prudence advice columnist for a decade. And you've seen her work in many publications, including the, the New York Times, O, Oprah Magazine, Washington Post, Esquire, Los Angeles Times, and more. And so what we're going to do today is have just a discussion about the book. I'm going to welcome both uh, Naomi and Emily to the stage. And uh, Emily will lead the discussion with Naomi, and then we'll leave some time for questions on the back end. So uh, please join me in welcoming Naomi Schaefer Riley and Emily Yoffe. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you, Naomi, and thank you for this terrific book. Thank you. Uh, and it's such an important subject. How did you come to write this book, spend two years investigating um, the people who are some of the most neglected and hidden in our society, uh, abused children, children who end up in the child protective system, foster kids? And we're going to go over a lot of specifics, but what are the headlines from your research? So I, I came into this research in a couple of different ways. Um, probably the most immediate was a book that I had written previously about American Indians. Um, and they, for those who are not familiar with Native communities in this country, they have some of the worst child welfare outcomes in the country. Um, uh, very high rates of, of child abuse and neglect. Um, and, uh, and a very dysfunctional foster care system. Um, and so writing about that, I sort of began to wonder, you know, what the rest of the children in the system were treated like. Um, and I spent some time as a columnist for the New York Post uh, where you'd regularly see headlines about child fatalities. Um, and child fatalities, which were in families known to the Administration for Children's Services. Um, these were not happening behind closed doors. They were people who had been regularly reported by their neighbors, by teachers, by uh, doctors. Um, their children were showing signs of abuse and severe neglect. Um, and I just wondered, you know, what, what was it? Why, why weren't these children being rescued? Um, and, and what could we do to ensure that this didn't keep happening? Um, I, I remember asking that question kind of in the context of, um, of kind of conservative thought about 20 years ago. Um, I remember asking people, like, what is the broken windows policy solution for child welfare? Um, and I, I didn't get a lot of satisfactory answers. Um, typically, the answer I got uh, had to do with the breakdown of the American family, um, which is a totally true and totally insufficient answer, in my opinion. Um, you know, there are you know 440,000 kids in foster care right now. Um, just you know, saying, well, that's the breakdown of the family, and that's what you get. Uh, I felt like really didn't um, didn't help us move along with this problem. And so, you know, those are the things that were really pushing me into this research. Um. We know we're not going to actually abolish the police, no matter what happens. But there is a movement in the child welfare community to um, abolish, quote, family policing. 
that's the new description that's being put on this whole system um, with the idea that uh, removing any child from a family is, is abusive and the wrong way to go. Um, is this getting traction? Is this something that uh, policymakers and the public need to be aware of? Is this being played out uh, in the real world? So if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have thought, well, there, you know, there are kind of a few fringe um, you know, people out there who think abolishing foster care you know, is kind of the, the way to go and the way to solve the problems of these families. Um, but I have to say in the last uh, two years, um, this movement has grown up alongside the defund or abolish the police movement. Um, and unlike the abolish or defund the police movement, uh, where I think you've seen quite a backlash from communities that have said, hey, wait, um, this is going to be a problem for my family and my <laughs> household and my kids who are you know, not being protected from crime, you have not seen a parallel backlash against the abolish family policing or abolish the foster care movement, because a lot of what goes on there is not easily seen by most people. Um, and so I think um, you know, there is a whole long list of things that people in that movement want to see. They have released a kind of manifesto uh, from something called the upend movement. Um, they want to abolish mandated reporting uh, by teachers and doctors. Um, they want to abolish uh, drug testing of uh, newborns or uh, pregnant mothers. They want to abolish foster care. They want to stop people from uh, having police intervene in domestic violence cases because many times that is where we first learn of a child being endangered when, you know, say, a boyfriend is beating, uh, you know, his girlfriend, and then we realize that there are young children in the home. So there's a whole long list of, uh, of incredibly, I think, dangerous policy proposals that are a part of this, and unfortunately, they're making their way from academia into the world of child welfare agencies. Throughout the book, you blow up the myth that... Um, abused and neglected children exists primarily because of poverty. That's the cause. The New York Times Sunday Magazine this past Sunday, I don't know if any of you saw it, had a cover story about a um, young girl growing up in New York with a fa large family of siblings who mostly been homeless through her childhood. And the subhead on the story was, what happens when trying to escape poverty means separating from your family at 13? But you say poverty is not the central problem. Um, what are, in your view, the actual problems? And how does this poverty myth stop us from addressing the real problems? So I think what is really driving the child welfare crisis in this country is, frankly, the drug crisis. Um, I think last year we saw 93,000 people in America die of drug overdoses. This is an enormous problem that we have not gotten our head around. Um, and when you think about all those adults who are affected by drugs, think about all the children whose lives those adults touch. Um, when you look at the numbers uh, strictly, you see that typically drug abuse or uh, alcohol abuse or mental illness, which is often uh, co-occurring with substance abuse, account for at least 40, 45% of, um, of the cases that are in the child welfare system. If you talk to experts about what is really going on, they would estimate it's probably closer to 80%. Um, I cannot, I, I would have a hard time thinking of a foster family that I've interviewed in the last four years who themselves could think of a case that did not involve substance abuse on some level. Um, and I think people just don't, don't understand how, sub, because you know, we're in this kind of like, yay, drugs, let's legalize drugs, drugs are totally harmless kind of, uh, you know, kind of culture right now. I don't think people really stop to think about how substance abuse affects parenting and child rearing. Um, and it particularly affects uh, you know, children who are really too young to care for themselves in any way. Um, children from zero to three are obviously um, in particular danger because they can't go to another adult for help uh, when, say, their, their parent who is suffering from substance abuse or mental illness you know, forgets to feed them or get the electricity turned on in the house or clothe them or properly supervise them. Um, 
there's this you know, stage that I refer to in the book. Um, it was one of my favorite stages of parenting, let me tell you. Um, it was the mobile but totally irrational stage um, you know, where your child is basically you know, about to run out the front door or swallow Legos or touch a hot stove or jump into the bathtub or whatever it is. And as a totally sober parent, I can tell you it is extremely difficult to monitor that behavior. So once you add in you know, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, mental illness, um, you know, it becomes almost impossible. And those children are, are truly in danger. A major theme of your book is how backward the entire system is. Uh, instead of placing the welfare of the child front and center, you say we pay, are paying way more attention to things like racial ideology, not putting children in homes where the, their race is different from the foster parents. Um, you say abusive or addicted parents are themselves seen as victims who must be protected. And um, you describe how because reunification or keeping children with their biological families is the ultimate goal, decisions are deferred and deferred. A, an entire childhood can be frittered away and no one has paid attention to the effects um, on the psychological, emotional uh, growth of the, the children. As you say in the book, we don't say to abused women, you've got to work it out with this guy. We're going to do everything we can to help you work it out. But that's essentially what we're saying on behalf of the children. How do we change this? So I, I think it's really, it's very hard to change it. Um, I mean, the, the thing about adults is they're very good at expressing their feelings, and they're much better at expressing them than children, which makes us feel sorry for adults. And, and frankly, we should have sympathy and empathy for the adults who are in the system. They often have been through the ringer. They have experienced poverty. They, many of them have themselves experienced the foster care system. And, and we should not be turning our backs on these adults or in any way stopping them from getting every possible service and, and a measure that is available to help them deal with whatever problems are leading to you know, them mistreating their children. I am, I am not, I'm not suggesting that we um, even not see them as victims, because in many cases they are victims of something. The question is, and this is the hardest question I think we have to ask ourselves in child welfare, is how long does a child have to wait? Um, you know, especially if that, that parent is, um, you know, engaged in this behavior when, a, when you have a young child, a child zero to three, where we know so much about the importance of that, you know, brain development during those years, the need for secure attachment in order to have proper social, emotional, intellectual development. Um, the idea that we would wait uh, you know, years for a parent to clean up their act, never knowing, of course, whether that will actually work out um, in order to then finally decide that maybe this child doesn't belong with that parent, I think is just, we are, we're frittering away their childhoods. And we are essentially sort of dooming that child. It, it, once, once that child who has been treated this way, who has been shuttled from one foster home to another, who has been shuttled back and forth from biological home to foster home, who has failed to form that real secure attachment, um, you know, they get to like 11 or 12, or they age out of foster care. And then we start saying, well, what are we going to do about the aging out problem? I mean, it's a hard problem to address, but you know, what, what were we thinking when this child was between the ages of zero and five? Um, so I think that you know, in order to sort of change the system, you know, one thing we really need to think seriously about is the timelines. Um, you know, we have in this country um, actual federal guidelines for what a timeline is, an appropriate timeline for a child in foster care. Um, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which was passed in the mid-90s with bipartisan support, says if a child has been in foster care for 15 out of the last 22 months, a state is supposed to start proceedings for the termination of parental rights. And that law is just ignored left and right. I mean, the average amount of time that a child was in foster care, according to 2019 statistics, was 20 months. That was the average. In New York, by the way, it's 30 months. So, I mean, talk about not paying attention to the timelines. How do you get to an average of 30 months? I mean, 
it's, it's, it's an incredible just ignorance or just willful desire to ignore the law um, that you see in family court. Um, but to get to the second part here, which I think is really important to think about, uh, is the racial element that is going on here. One of the biggest um, you know, uh, accusations that you hear about foster care now in the child welfare system is that it is structurally racist. And so in order to fix this problem, in order to fix the fact that we are disproportionately, uh, according to folks, targeting black families and separating black children from their black parents, um, we should be uh, limiting the amount, we, sh we should be checking our Excel spreadsheets, really, to make sure it all comes out even in the end. Um, it, it, these accusations take absolutely no account of the fact that black children are mistreated frankly, at a much higher rate than white children in this country. In fact, they're three times as likely to die from maltreatment as white children in this country. That is a really harsh statistic, but it's, it's really hard to, you know, to fudge it. Like, you know, you could say, oh, you're just being racist by accusing these black parents of mistreating them. These are children who are dying, and we're, you know, telling you what the race is. I had this really interesting conversation recently with somebody who um, compared it to if we had like a lead abatement program. And he said, so imagine we have a lead abatement program um, in St. Louis. And we said to folks, okay, if you have lead in your home, you know, come tell us and we will offer you this public service where we're gonna fix the problem. And you, know, you had all these families come to you and then you looked at the, you know, your clipboard and you said, does anyone have a clipboard anymore? And you said, um, uh, there are too many black families on this list. You know, people would say, well, that's crazy because obviously you have you know, black, black families disproportionately living in impoverished neighborhoods or disproportionately living in homes that haven't had lead abatement. Of course, you know, you'd wanna you know, deal with all of those black families. You wouldn't turn some of them away. But that is exactly what we're doing with Child Protective Services. We're saying, uh, oops, you know, we have too many black families on this list that we're investigating, too many black children in foster care, and we need to make our numbers come out a little bit more even. And so let's, you know, let's fiddle with this a little bit. Let's, let's have a little bit less surveillance of black families. Let's make sure we take away fewer children who are black into foster care, not understanding that this is a service that we are providing to protect children. You talked about this federal law that passed in the 90s to speed up termination of parental rights. But aren't you kind of describing the pendulum that swings back and forth? That was an era where wasn't the emerging consensus. We've got to act more swiftly, um, remove children uh, early. And that's, even though the law is still on the books, is there any system in which that's the goal to uh, sever the parental rights and get the children adopted? As right, I think that's the that's the problem. So a lot of child welfare policy is really just determined by the culture of the agencies and the culture of courts. And I think that um, this is a problem. I mean, we we need if we have legislation on the books, we either need to have a debate about whether that legislation should be there and repealed or we need to follow it. And instead, you have everybody sort of deciding for themselves, well, how they feel about it. Maybe we should give the parents another chance. Maybe this, you know, maybe they didn't, you know, fully take, you know, they, they you know, they've only, the child's only been returned three or four times. And, you know, maybe that the parent seems like they mean well. Like, this is, this is a federal law. Like, how do you, um, we don't, I don't think we treat most other laws this way. And when we do, it suggests that we don't have a lot of respect for the law, but it also suggests that the judges just get to make up things as they go along. And, and frankly, that's actually a complaint that I think people on all sides of the foster care system have. Like foster parents, biological parents, you know, lawyers all have this sense when they walk into family court that it's like that it's not real court, that, that we don't have real laws that we're following, that there's retaliation that goes on with caseworkers, um, that judges are kind of deciding more based on their gut feeling than on you know, what the law says. So I would I prefer if we want to have a debate about whether that's the appropriate timeline, we should have that debate. But just making up the law as you go along, I don't think is really a good idea. You say that the dramatic cases on either end are not really representative of what's going on. You mentioned the dead child, the child who's been in the system. The, everyone should have seen what was coming and didn't. On the other hand, the other kind of case that gets headlined the middle, headlines the middle class child 
who's the nine or 10 year old walking home from the park and someone calls the police and the middle class parents have child protective services coming and taking the kid away. Um, but can you talk about or give some examples because you have many in the book about what we're talking about? Who, what are the lives like of the kids who end up in the system who are typical? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a typical case, so there's a, a couple that I interviewed, um, Arlem and Jeremy. They got married when gay marriage was first legalized. They wanted to adopt initially, and then they decided they were going to adopt out of the foster care system. Um, and so they, uh, they, got, they did their training, and they uh, got this call one evening. Uh, we have a one- and a two-year-old um, who, who, who need a foster home. Um, with, they, it, was, it was probably like a half an hour, maybe it was an, a couple of hours between them. They got the call when a caseworker showed up at their door. They ran to Walmart. They both called their mothers to ask what it is that they should buy. And um, they get home. The caseworker's there. Um, the kids have uh, cigarette burns on them. Uh, there's evidence of sexual abuse. Um, the mother uh, probably was not the person responsible. It was probably the men who were in her home. Um, the person who was uh, the, the guy who was in her home at the time was not the father of either of the two children. Um, and by the way, this is not atypical. The, the people who are disproportionately dangerous to small children, unfortunately, in these cases, are non-relative males. That's a very typical uh, situation that you find in foster care. Um, so, you know, they took these boys into their home. Um, they, uh, one of the boys actually uh, ended up being reunified with his father. Um, and the father, you know, really meant well. He felt like he was unable to fully care for the child. He was a truck driver. Um, and he really was so happy about the way that this couple had actually taken care of his son that he actually is sort of co-parents with them now. Um, they, uh, you know, he has them, he has the boy most of the time, but they regularly hit the boy regularly visits them and has become kind of part of their extended family. The other child um, is probably even more typical in the sense that he has spent years going in and out of uh, foster care. So he's been reunified with his mother. His mother had serious addiction problems. Um, she would not show up for visits for months on end. She would tell a judge that she was getting clean. She would say she was interested in reunifying with the child. Um, but it just, it didn't work. She, this went on, you know, Arlem and Jeremy talk about how they would, you know, pack up all of the things that you need to take care of a baby, the bottles and the change of clothes and everything, you know, drive, uh, you know, more than an hour to see this woman. And she just just wouldn't show up, and then they just go back home. Um, and they would try to describe this to the judge, um, and the judge, you know, told them on more than one occasion, "I'm just not interested in what you have to say. You're just foster parents." Um, so these people who knew this boy better than anybody, um, their their voice was discounted in the system. Um, and so this went on, I think, for more than two years before finally they announced that the mother was going to reunify with the child took the boy away. They didn't see him for, I think, more than a year. And then it turns out somebody else reported the mother for another violation. They never found out what it was for. And the child was brought back to their home, I think, after more than a year, maybe two years away from them. Um, so this was a case where, I mean, this is, these are the developmental years of a child. You know, this, this boy, by the time he was returned to them, was maybe five years old after having gone through all this. And obviously, they're thrilled that he is back in their home and that they've been able to permanently adopt him. But they're angry, and I think we should all be, at the kind of what, what had to lead to this um, and, and the trauma. And he came back to their home a different person after all that because he had to re-experience all that abuse and neglect. And they don't even know really what happened. Um, so I would say the back and forth there is really typical, the discounting of foster parents um, you know, they're just treated like glorified teenage babysitters, um, uh, the way that they are not privy to information about what is going on in the life of children that they've cared for for years at a time. Um, that, that is the part of situation, the, the system that is both typical and I think should most outrage us. You describe in the book how we're attracting the wrong kind of people in every part of the system. The wrong people are caseworkers. The, in many cases, not the one you just described, the wrong people become foster parents. The wrong people become, run the family courts. What's wrong with them? And uh, what should we 
who should be there instead. Yeah. So just kind of starting with the beginning of the system, I mean, I would say, you know, there are plenty of caseworkers who mean well. Um, sometimes there are young, recent college graduates who just think, I want to help families, and I'm going to go into um, to work for CPS because I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to help families this way. I'm going to help put families back together too. Um, they are. Uh, Often ill-trained, um, they're if they if they get training in this kind of thing, it's training about cultural sensitivity. It's about you know understanding uh, that different people, different cultures treat their children differently. I guess, um, but they are not prepared for what is often police work. I mean, they're being asked to go to you know some not nice neighborhoods, knock on doors of strangers, not knowing who is on the other side, and say, hey, I heard you've been abusing your child. <laughs> like, this is, this is not a recipe for success. Um, and so little wonder, there's like a 40% turnover rate for child welfare agencies. So, you know, you, then you have like this just huge, you know, slate of inexperienced people doing this work. You haven't trained them well and they quit. And then we start the process all over again. Um, I think if we wanted to fix that, I think that we would treat not all child, not the whole child welfare agency, but CPS workers, I think should be treated much more like first responders, um, like law enforcement. They should be trained both for the sake of their own safety and also because we're asking them to like look at the, look around the home. You have to be very quick. You have to be looking around the home like, what do I see evidence of before this person gets angry and kicks me out of the house, basically? I have to be able to talk to a child. I mean, we saw evidence during the pandemic that a lot of child welfare workers just didn't go do their jobs. They were like, well, you know, I, it, it, this, you know this COVID thing is contagious. I'm not, a, I'll stand on the, on the front lawn and you show me the kid. I mean, that is not an investigation and we would be outraged if police officers, you know, pretended that was an investigation during COVID, but that's what happened with the in in California. Basically, like there was two months of almost no investigations going on because Gavin Newsom said, you know, we don't really need the the child welfare agency that much. So that I think that would be where I would start with the caseworkers. In terms of the family courts, if you talk to lawyers, and I've talked to a lot of lawyers about family court, it does not attract for a variety of reasons the highest caliber folks in the legal profession. Um, it is not a well-paid profession, um, but it also it's really hard. Like, I mean, there's a lot of law that's hard, but dealing with family court cases and foster care cases is just, it's heart-wrenching for folks. And a lot of people don't stay in it for a long time. Um, I actually even, I mean, and even by the time you get up to the level of judge, I mean, I talked to one family court judge who was not willing to like tell me the story on the record, but he said, I know of a judge who screwed up in like another part of the court system and was demoted to family court as a result. Like, it's the rubber room. Yeah, for that judges. is, <laughs> sadly, I think that's true. Um, so, you know, I mean, do these family courts need more resources? I think probably that's true. Um, you know, we need more judges. The, the cases are just, they just seem to be multiplying. And, but the bigger problem is that they never get concluded. Like, this is what I'm talking about with the timelines, too. If you just have more and more cases coming in, but you never close a case, you know, well, what do you think is going to happen? And a lot of the judges are unwilling to sort of really force lawyers to, you know, to stick to timelines, you know, to make sure that everybody's there. I mean, just, just spending a day in family court is just, it is the most frustrating experience. I think I watched one day, I went to Queens Family Court, I watched nine cases, eight of which had just continuances. I mean, they're just nothing is settled. And some of them have continuances because someone didn't show up, the paperwork was not filed properly, uh, you know, someone decides they want to appoint a new lawyer instead of the, you know, the, the one the public is you know, providing for them. I mean, this can just go on endlessly. Um, so yes, more resources, but we have to sort of say, look, you, you know, you need to put these folks on a timeline. And then, you know, finally, the question is foster parents. And this is kind of an interesting discussion. I, I talked to a lot of people about the question of paying foster parents. Like, we don't pay foster parents very much. Should we pay them more? Or will that only sort of further attract people who are interested in fostering for the money? I mean, that, I think this is a, it's an interesting question, and somebody I was talking to actually compared it to um, donating blood and donating, pla and donating platelets, which you can actually pay for. 
um, you get you get paid for. So it turns out uh, with platelets, um, you know, they they, t they ask you a bunch of questions about you know the level of contamination, like what what kinds of problems you might have had. But they also check it, um, and they find that when people are donating, this is like a kind of far-fetched comparison, but I think it works. But you know, for people who are donating platelets, or they're not donating them, they're basically selling them, they're much more likely to lie about their exposure to, to things that would basically make the blood contaminated. Um, and so the question is, like, you know, how do we encourage people to do fostering, especially because the, the, the kids are so aware of the money. If you talk to enough foster kids, I mean, they some of them can tell you to the dollar exactly how much a family has been paid to care for them because the family has made them aware of it or they have been in so many other families that have made them aware of it. That I think the question is, how do we get middle class Americans to engage in foster care? Um, but right now, like the, um, this pastor I talked to in New Orleans, like he, his, his wife really wanted to do foster care. He did not. He was quite reluctant. And he went to an informational meeting, like at his wife's behest, like, fine, OK, I'll go. And he left the meeting, and he said, we have to do foster care because I don't want the other people in that room doing it. <laughs> I mean, which is terrible. But he said, you said, the people are asking these questions. He said, one woman raised her hand and said, do I have to keep these kids in the same part of my house as my other kids? I mean, he was so outraged. So. I mean, the question is like, how do we outrage more people like that? Not that you want those people in every information session, but how do you outrage enough people to say, okay, fine, if this is what's going to be out there, like, I better do it myself. Um, but I think a lot of the key to doing that uh, is by is 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 faith-based organizations and churches that have really encouraged many more middle-class, stable families to do this work. And before you know, people jump on me because you know the, I say middle class. Like, like it. Of course, you don't need to have lots of money to love a child. Like I, I know that. And there are plenty of poor families in this country that never come into contact with child welfare services at all, and would make good foster parents. The problem is that once you are dealing with a child who has already been traumatized in so many ways, putting them into a home where families are worried about how they're going to make their next rent check is just, it's not a recipe for success. You want as much stability as possible. Like, this is not a couple that is screaming at each other about, you know, uh, you, you spent too much at, you know, on food last night, and so I'm worried about how we're going to afford rent. Um, so how do, we, how do we find those families to do it? One of the your solutions is what you just mentioned, um, religious organizations and people who are coming at this um, from a sense that I'm being called to do this. But there's a lot of tension going on between the welfare authorities and religious organizations. Can you elaborate on that and, and what's happening there and sure. um, how we can make that better? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I would just I would start by sort of just talking about a little bit just so people get a sense of just the the ways in which some of these religious institutions have really started a kind of revolution when it comes to adoption and foster care. Um, uh, you know, prior to let's say 15 years ago, um, you know, you know, foster parents, you know, you. You would leave a message at like a state, you know, answering machine saying, "I want to foster." Half the time, no one would call you back. I mean, so this is kind of the level of customer service that you're talking about. Like, hey, I'm volunteering to do this really hard thing. Anybody? Anybody? Um, and so, I think the first uh, insight that a lot of these faith-based organizations had was, like, let's make this recruitment process different. Um, let's uh, let's talk to people instead of putting up a picture of the child on the nightly news and saying. Hey, isn't this kid cute? Don't you want to take him home tonight? Which you know, this is. Do kind they of, still do that? I remember. There is you still would... yes. Okay. Wednesday's child, Monday's yeah. child. I mean, I, I'm not saying it never works, but it's. I think it would be what you know what media people would call broadcasting instead of narrow casting. Um, how you know the audience for the nightly news may not be the exact audience, or they may not feel compelled, um, you know, to get involved just because that picture is adorable. Um, and so what many of these faith-based institutions did was they said, you know, we're going to talk to people in our congregation, and many of these were evangelical, large evangelical churches. We're going to talk to people in our congregation about kids in our zip code um, who actually are in need now. 
Um, and that was a much more, I think, the folks I've talked to say, much more compelling message. Um, so that was the first thing. But they also sort of said, well, you know, to the state, you have these requirements for uh, how to train foster families. There was an interesting book that came out last fall. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was by a woman who did foster care. And she was, she was describing how the training was mostly about what she couldn't do and not about what she could do. So it was you know, things about like fire extinguishers and don't ever close the door you know, while you're sitting on a child's bed. Or, I mean, just the kind of stuff that was not, you know, these kids have been so traumatized. And even somebody who has parented before often feels at sea when it comes to understanding how to raise these kids. Um, so many of these faith-based organizations said, like, in addition to telling you how many fire extinguishers to have and like explaining to the state laws, we're also going to provide more like trauma-informed care and really try to un help you understand what it is that you're getting into so that you're prepared for it. Um, the, the next thing they did uh, was they really supported these families. I mean, half of foster families quit within the first year. Um, if you look at surveys of foster families, um, a lot of them don't say, you know, the problem is the kid um, or even the problem is the toll that this kid was taking on my <laughs> marriage or my finance or anything like that. Um, part of it is like, they'll really say, you know, the, the way they were treated by the system. Um, but even still, I think the toll that it takes on your marriage and maybe the other children in your home um, is, you know, was, was clearly a, a problem. And obviously, churches don't want to be in the habit of, of, of encouraging people to do foster care if what they find is like families, you know, break up as a result. Um, and so they really sort of provided this amazing community of support where they, you know, um, recruited other members of the community to actually um, provide respite care or, you know, help build furniture at the last minute or just pray for them. Um, and I think that that ended up being, uh, you know, sort of a tremendous success. So all of this is kind of the preface to the answer to your question um, about why I think that even though um, these religious institutions have said, for instance, in many cases, like they won't place kids uh, with gay couples um, or you know non-traditional families. Although many of them, by the way, do end up you know do place with single mothers. Um, they they need to be at the table. We do, we do not have the luxury of picking and choosing which agencies and which people uh, should be you know should be doing foster care right now. We based on their religious beliefs. Um, so my attitude is kind of let a thousand flowers bloom. I think we should have agencies in this country that specifically cater to gay couples. I think we should have agencies in this country that because of their religious beliefs, you know, decide these are the couples we're gonna cater to. Um, and, and I want all that to coexist. And when you think about, you know, the, the Supreme Court, you know, uh, heard this case last June um, uh, between the, City of Philadelphia, Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, um, and uh, Catholic Social Services was was sued uh, because they were only they would only place with same sex couples. Um, I think that we, in some ways, looking at the, this question entirely wrong. I mean, nobody I think has a right to do foster care, um, but I think children should have a right to a stable, loving home. And so the question is, who who is out there willing to provide that? And in most cases, it is religious families and religious organizations doing this work. I mean, as one person said to me, like, you know, if God was not telling me to do this, I definitely would not be involved. <laughs> and and I, I, I really sympathize with that. I mean, people ask me, like, what, you know, what doing foster care is like with some of these states. And I'm like, well, imagine going to the DMV every day. I mean, that, that's kind of like the experience that you have. And so, you know, if there is somebody up there sort of telling you this is a good idea, um, I, I think, you know, we have to understand that, that, um, that that's an important voice to, to have at the table. Did, while you were researching and writing this book, did you consider becoming a foster parent or did you realize no way? Um, I, you know, it's a question I get asked a lot. I, I guess I've thought about it. You know, it's interesting. My, 
Um, my parents actually considered it briefly. So this is a sort of funny story, like after my sister and I left for college because we were such amazing children. <laughs> um, my parents decided, you know, well, wait, maybe we should try adopting more. Um, and so, you know, imagine you, I got this call. I remember I was in my college dorm room, Massachusetts Department of, you know, Children's Services called me to, like, ask me what I thought of my parents. And, like, you know, <laughs> should we trust them with another kid? Like, how often do you get that, that phone call? Um, and they went through a very long process, you know, trying to decide, and they eventually decided not to. Um, and I think, you know, one of the issues was definitely that they didn't know but anyone else who was doing this. Like, I, I mean, I, I think that in some ways, you know, they carved their own path. They definitely uh, were willing to do things other people weren't. But this was so outside of anything that they experienced and outside of their comfort zone that I think that they worried it would it would be overwhelming, and I think that that's um, that's probably there's probably something to that. There is definitely like a, a cultural divide in this country, and partly it's because of I think the faith based institutions. Like there's there are places where um, you know there are, uh, you know these organizations that support and recruit uh, foster kids, and they they tend to be um, kind of in the south and the Midwest, and maybe the um, you know further out west too. But you know, in the Northeast, when I talk to, I belong to one of the largest um, synagogues in Westchester. There are 800 families, and um, when I talk to people about doing foster care, like they look at me like <laughs> I'm crazy. I mean, just you know, I've had people ask me, "Well, you know, don't you know, don't Christians just do that because they want to convert the kids?" I'm like, oh my God, like. <laughs> Anyway, we could talk about that yeah. another time. But I think you know it, it. You have to sort of feel like you're part of a community um, that supports this, and um, you know where it's it's normal. And it's it's not just that fostering is not normal. Like I've I've talked to people about um, you know what they call foster friendly churches. So people who walk into a church with you know a child who has been traumatized, like a child who might be banging their head against the wall or Biting themselves, or you know, just, or you know, having outbursts, and do you belong to you know the kind of religious institution where people think, okay, well, you know, that that child is totally welcome here, and I understand that disruption, and and that is not, you know, we're not going to you know point and stare or wonder why that person stayed, um, you know, through the service, and I think. In, you know, I, I have friends with kids who are, um, you know, who have developmental problems. And I think they would even say that they don't feel welcome in a lot of the institutions uh, in their community because, you know, the way we think about parenting today is like, you know, how, how would I get my kid a higher SAT score? They're not, they're not thinking about this level of, um, you know, dealing with a, a child's trauma or dealing with that much different behavior. And so, you know, I think if we're going to encourage more people to foster, like, there, there have to be so many cultural changes. On the complete other end of this, you, in the book, explore um, institutions for children. I mean, there used to be orphanages, and, um, you know, we have horrifying images of those. But you talk to some people who now adults, older adults, who were placed in such institutions, decent ones, who have a lot of positive things to say. And in that um, New York Times Magazine story we were talking about, the, the girl in it ends up at the Hershey School in Pennsylvania, which is essentially a boarding school model for kids who are removed from their family. So it's not foster parents, it's house parents and a group of kids living together, but it's a different, you know, it's, it's not, I'm your mom and dad, I'm your house parent. And although in the time story, it didn't work for this young woman, and the, the writer said, the younger the children arrive at Hershey, the better their chance of success there. It seems to be a reasonable model, but we're, do you think we should try more institutional care, use some of these models? Would that help? Yeah. So, you know, 
in the last number of decades, um, I think very reasonably, people came to the conclusion that children are best raised in families. And I, I don't think that we should move away from that idea. I think that that's generally true. Um, the problem is, you know, what, what kind of families are children best raised in? Um, and so, like you mentioned, I mean, I had an interesting conversation with a guy named Richard McKenzie, um, who's a, a now professor of economics at UC Irvine. He's probably past 80 now. Um, but he just, you know, wrote a, wrote a couple books about growing up in a group home. Um, and actually, the, this started when uh, Newt Gingrich was proposing a return of orphanages in the 1990s, for those of you who remember. Um, and he remembered hearing all this outrage, and he ended up writing an article for the Wall Street Journal about why are people so outraged about orphanages? I grew up in one. In fact, he, when he goes around speaking to people, not just about his experience, but his professional success, you know, people ask him you know, how he turned out this way despite his growing up in an orphanage. And he said, I am the way I am because I grew up in an orphanage. Like, you know, the way he described, you know, the dysfunctional uh, alcoholic father he was living with, you know, he and his brother were basically out running the streets. Um, and this was the this was the alternative at the time. He went to, a, I think it was a Presbyterian home. Um, he, you know, lived with house parents. And, you know, and he, you know, he learned to work. You know, he went to school there. Um, and this was how he grew up. Now, you know, we're, we're not going to return to that on a widespread basis now, but I think that there is a clear place for what's called congregate care in the array of options that we have for kids. Um, so, for instance, there's a, you know, place called, you know, Utah Youth Villages, um, and that's for kids who cannot right now be living in a family. Their needs are too high. The behavioral challenges are too great. The mental health issues are too much for a typical foster family to handle. And literally, the way they talk about Utah Youth Villages is, you know, they have a couple of house parents, maybe like, you know, who are full time employed, like this is their job. And then they have, you know, six or seven kids living in a home. They, they view their job as to either make that kid able to go back to their biological home if that's an appropriate placement, or to literally make them adoptable by a family. Like, you know, teaching them how to live in a family again, how to, you know, it's, you know, joke about pass the potatoes, but like, you know, how to act around other people living in a home. Um, I think it, it's, it's really, we, we underestimate how hard that is to teach a child who hasn't had that experience um, for a long time, if ever. Um, so I think that there's definitely a role for those kind of homes. Um, I think that there's also a very big need for, uh, for um, homes that are going to deal with real psychiatric needs for kids. And by the way, we're seeing a shortage of these kind of homes, not just for kids in foster care, but everywhere now. I mean, you have just stories. There was a story the other day of, like, of a you know, kid in um, Boston who needed you know, a psychiatric bed. He stayed in a hospital, just a plain old hospital bed. I think he was like six or seven for 30 days while people were just waiting to find him a psychiatric bed. So when you think about the fact that like a parent who is willing to pay and has health insurance has that much trouble finding a child a place, the kids in, in foster care, I think, just have no chance. And what we have done through Congress and through state funding is we have shrunk the, the options for those kids. We have said, up, oh, congregate care should not be an option. We are going to close those beds. We are going to defund much of the congregate care We've seen some of these institutions as abusive, and we just we need to get rid of them. And then magically, apparently, we'll find places for kids. Well, you know, this spring, 400 kids in Texas were sleeping in offices. Why are they sleeping in offices? Because we don't have another place for them, because we have not found qualified, good foster families for them to be with, because we have closed congregate care options. Like, they have to go somewhere. And so, to me, like, <sighs> You know, look, we're we're at, at the American Enterprise Institute here. Like, you know, we are fiscally responsible people, and we th this is an area where I am happy to throw money at this problem because I think there should be empty beds because kids should not have to be shoved into 
you know, we should not be shoving square pegs into round holes just because that is the one last available place we have for this shot. Oh, well, they really need a, a severe, you know, uh, they, they really have severe psychiatric problems. But all we have available is a foster home that says that they can take an eight-year-old. So we'll just, you know, put that teenager there. This does not make any sense to me. But this is where, you know, kind of we keep going with our, the court system. I mean, Washington State just had a federal judge announce you can no longer have kids sleeping in offices. You read a news story, like you get to the 11th paragraph, and it says, everyone is so happy they reached this decision. It is not clear where these kids will be sleeping instead. OK, I mean, so I just I think congregate care needs to be on the menu for kids. Um, and I think that we need to just provide them with as many options as we can. Thank you so much. I, we're coming toward the end, so I want to leave time for questions. Okay. And raise your hand. I th okay, yeah, we, we have, have a do have someone with a mic. <laughs> Take off my mask. Yes. Um, thank you. This is really interesting. Um, I have a question kind of linked to the New York Times story, which I think a lot of people read about Dasani, which was a follow-up to the earlier yes. story. But it speaks to something you flagged when you first started talking about the, the focus on cultural differences. And I remember reading in that story how, and in fact, the reporter spent a lot of time focusing on how Dasani was taught to speak appropriately at the Hershey School and how this was the insinuation was that this was somehow not right, that she shouldn't have to be made to speak well, when in fact, as, as the description of Hershey is very clearly stated, they're trying to get kids college ready, workplace ready. And, um, and then when she ends up going back home, you know, because of the, she had several violent altercations at the school, there was a sort of sense of relief among her family that she was back because of course she'd taken on a role as a parent herself for most of her life. And I, I made the, horrible mistake of reading the comments on this piece, which you should never do, but people were just outraged on behalf of everyone, Dasani, her mother, all the other siblings, but nobody spoke to these two issues. Why is it bad to teach a kid who comes from poverty and abuse how to present herself, how to, how to really you know, buckle down and study and, and be able to go out into the world? Um, why is that culturally inappropriate? Um, because some of her teachers were in fact African Americans and they, they spoke to that issue. And secondly, are we kind of on empathy overload with these sorts of stories in a way that doesn't speak to the solution? Because you do have to get to the 11th paragraph of the story where everyone's celebrating their empathy for closing a home or for this girl going back to her family when in fact, as, as a practical matter, I sort of read it as a tragedy. So if you have any thoughts on those. Yeah, I definitely read that story as a tragedy. And, and part of the reason that I think you have empathy for her, I mean, you have empathy for her for so many reasons, is because when you talk to um, you know, kids who have grown up in the foster care system, many of them have this um, image in their mind of what their life would have been like if they had been able to remain with their biological family. That you know, either that they would have been able to prevent some problem that happened in their family. I mean, Dasani was clearly helping to take care of her younger siblings, but that if they had stayed, maybe their mother would have cleaned up her act, or you know, things just things would have been okay if the Administration for Children's Services hadn't kept knocking on their door. Um, and, and you feel sympathy for that attitude because you, you do understand, like, they wished things could have been different. And we all wish things could have been different. But you know, the idea that child welfare was to blame for that, I think, is, is, the, is the problem. It's, it's, mis it's misdiagnosing the problem. The family had so much dysfunction, drug use, men coming in and out of the home who were not related to the children, violence. Um, you know, as a society, we have to be reacting to those problems. Um, and the whole notion that it was an escape from, that she was trying to escape poverty was the problem. I mean, this family had been helped by any number of social service programs. I mean, the, the, but the money had been misused. The money was being used probably for drugs and other, you know. And so the, the question is, like, you know, maybe poverty is not the problem. And maybe it is, as you say, like, it's, it's, we can have as much empathy as we want, but, but there are cultural problems here. I mean, family structure 
is so tied to you know, child maltreatment. I mean, if you are living in a home with a, a, a non-relative male, you are about 10 times as likely to suffer abuse as if you were living in a two-parent married family. I mean, it's, it's not that every single mother is having this experience, but when you are trying to diagnose like what went wrong here, you can't just pretend that it's just because they were poor. Like, there are so many other factors. Quick follow-up, does do federal agencies or state governments, do their rules acknowledge that detail about non-related men at home in the kid, in, at home being the biggest risk for abuse to the kid? Is that acknowledged in any of the, the rules you came across? So it's not acknowledged in the rules. I mean, essentially, when you're training caseworkers, you know, if you were properly training them, you would say to them, no, this non-relative male is a clear risk. And most caseworkers, I would say, probably understand that. Whether they understand how big a risk or how to weigh that risk, I think is, is hard to say. One of the things that I talk about in the book um, is the use of predictive analytics in order to, for us to better understand which children are most at risk. So there's an interesting pilot program that's going on in Allegheny County, the area outside of Pittsburgh right now, um, where when you call, a, a, when, when, a, when a report is made of maltreatment against a child, um, there's all sorts of data that we already have about most of these families. It involves um, data about their, you know, whether they're, you know, there's truancy issues, data about the, the, um, the prison records of people who are living in that home, data about who is actually living in that home and who is receiving all sorts of benefits, uh, you know, public benefits. Um, uh, you know, who has, uh, you know, uh, substance abuse issues. Um, and so when the, those, all those sort of factors are put into an algorithm, it gives us a good sense of which children we should be visiting very quickly. It doesn't, you know, say, oh, well, we know these parents are guilty of abuse, so lock them up and take that child away. But it does sort of weigh these risks in an appropriate way based on past experience. So we know, you know, so the algorithm takes account of the fact um, that these numbers are very high for non-relative males, particularly non-relative males with long rap sheets. Um, and so the, the algorithm would say, like, it's really important that we visit this child in the next 24 hours. Have you, so this sort of follows from that question, have you seen places where you feel like it's being done right, either because you see faith-based faith -based communities, um, nonprofit organizations, states or municipalities that have um, laws or things in place that are doing it well? Um, yeah, where, where do you see, um, good progress being made? Um, or do you see places that are continuing to move, move backwards? I would say the, the progress that I've seen is mostly on the um, recruitment, training, and support of foster families. I mean, there are, these organizations are popping up all the country. Um, one place I visited was really interesting um, where they've really kind of taken off is Arkansas. Um, there's a group called The Call, which is now in, I think, 75% of the counties in Arkansas. And some of these are very rural places. So the idea that they've been able to kind of take hold there and help support quality foster parents uh, there, I think, is really important. Unfortunately, I think when it comes to, um, you know, child welfare is really a state or, in some case, county-based system. Um, the, the ideology in those places has really just become per pervasive. It's, it's, it's an ideology of family preservation and reunification at all costs. I think that's how social workers are trained. I think that's what family courts are trained to do. Um, I think that's to the extent that states have passed their own laws about this. Um, it's, it's very much that way. And you see so much of the system moving in this direction. Um, Many of you may be familiar with the CASA program, Court Appointed Special Advocates. Um, I talk in the book about how I think they're a great, you know, independent way for, you know, people who are, uh, you know, who, who may not want to be foster parents, but who may want to become involved in the system. It's a great way for them to learn more about the system, but I think it's also a great way for the system to um, 
sense that somebody is watching, um, that there are people in the community who are really kind of going to family court and trying to understand what's going on there and don't want you know, all of this nonsense to happen. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I wrote an article recently about how CASA is sort of, this is too hard a term, but kind of being co-opted. Now people think we should not have court-appointed special advocates who were supposed to mere only look out for the best interests of children. Now CASAs should be family advocates. So now they're representing not only the best interests of the individual child, they have to represent that child's biological parents' interests. Um, and I feel like the biological parents' interests are already being represented. They have lawyers, and they are also adults who can speak and speak articulately in many cases. The, so I, I think we're kind of muddying the waters by sort of saying, oh, you know, the, the goal here, even of CASAs, is, is family preservation and reunification, as opposed to saying, you know, you, the CASA, you have, <laughs> you have one job, <laughs> as the saying goes, and your job is to represent the best interests of a child. So I worry that so much of the system is headed in that direction that I'm, I'm not seeing that kind of independence that, that I'd like to see in more of these agencies. Well, that, that's the point we started with. Almost no one puts the child's interest in the center, and that's really discouraging to hear that, the, that this institution that's doing that is then told to expand to the family who the best interest may be you don't go back with your family. Right. I mean, can you imagine if like, this is how regular courts worked? If we said, like, <laughs> oh, the, you know, the public defender should be in charge not only of representing the defendant, but also you know, representing the accuser and like, a few, few other people. Like, we have an adversarial court system, not because we're mean, um, but because we think it's important that everybody have their own representative in the court system. Well, and as you say, as we talked about in abuse cases, the goal is not reunification and get, keeping this couple together, even if in some cases that could be an idea, but the whole system is not driving it, telling the woman, you need to work this out. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. So, I have a microphone. Oh, thank you. I'll take this on. For, for people considering being foster parents, they're kind of on the fence about it. They're not really sure which way to go. You know, they see the good things, they see that, you know, maybe our home's not big enough, maybe this, maybe that. What do you find is the, the most, uh, what, what reason sticks out the most that people say, eh, I better not, I'm not going to, I don't think I should do that right now? So uh, probably the, the biggest thing that you hear and, and, some, and something that I hear foster parents sort of tell, talking to their friends about who ask them this question is, I wouldn't be able to give that child up. Like, I wouldn't be able to take care of this child fully, to love them completely, to provide them with a stable home, to become attached to them, and then have the state tell me it's time for this child to go back home. I, I would say more than any way they're treated by the system, more than any kind of fear about the size of their house or anything like that, I would say it's this sense of, um, can I... Can I do this to the best of my ability and still live through the process of separation from this child, even if it's the best thing for the child, like even if the parents really do clean up their act and really should be reunified with the child? Um, and I would say like every foster parent I've talked to about this has a different kind of process for dealing with this. Um, definitely there is a sense of how important the um, the communal support and the spiritual support is here. Like, um, I think that the, par the foster parents who are deal, you know, who are who are happier about it or who deal with it more um, better are the ones who do think the child is going back to a better situation. Like, it becomes all that much harder if you think the child is going to be reunified with the family. But now I'm worried about that child's safety. Like that. That is a whole other level of, uh, of heartbreak, I think. But, but definitely the idea of, of forming this attachment and then having to sever it in some way. I, I will say we have a different system now than we had before. There used to be a much clearer separation that was really more enforced by child welfare that once a child went back, you really didn't have any contact with them and you weren't supposed to. Now what I find is that many of these organizations really encourage, if possible, 
um, you know, continued contact with the foster parent if the biological parents are willing. Because the foster parents can serve not only as a way to support the child, um, but also as a way to support the whole family. I mean, they'll say to the biological parents, like, you know, if you need, uh, you know, if you ever need emergency babysitting, if you need somebody at the last minute to fill in, you know, I, I know this child well and I could do that. Sometimes the, you know, family needs support, needs help finding jobs or other things. Um, you know, foster parents can kind of serve as a, as a connection to community that many of these families are really lacking. Related to that question is, is are, do some parents or potential foster parents not do it because they're worried about getting a false accusation against them? I've had talked to parents who have had false accusations made against them. Um, I think it's it's definitely a concern. Um, you know, there have been situations like there was a, a woman who I um, you know talked to extensively in. Um, she lives in Mississippi, and she and her husband actually um, often have a home for um, children who need a lot of uh, medical care. And her husband is actually an emergency room nurse. Um, and uh, on one occasion, like a, a child uh, ended up getting access to medication that they weren't supposed to have, and a whole investigation was opened up into their home, their biological. I mean, you know, these are people who, by the way, like had spent more than a decade caring for, you know, a, a child on a ventilator. I mean, you know, I'm talking about real medical needs, and so an investigation was opened up into their home. I mean, it, it's a very scary thing to experience, that level of, of scrutiny and the feeling like, now my own family you know, could be in danger from this situation. Um, but I wouldn't say it's high on the list of reasons that people don't get into it in the first place. And then finally, aging out kids who are, what, I think it's 18 or whatever it is, suddenly, what, is, what can be done there for kids who are aging out or about to age out that can, to shore up that part of the system? Um, so many states have now raised the age at which uh, children can remain in the system. Some states are as high as 23 now, uh, where you can remain in foster care, receiving, um, staying in transitional housing, receiving some kind of payment from the state government, um, you know, and, and other forms of, of support. Um, I think that that's, that is a positive move. Mo you know, most 18-year-olds who have been in the system are not equipped to just go out on their own. Unfortunately, many of them choose to. They're so tired of the system at that point that they want nothing to do with these people by the time they reach 18, and some try even aging out even sooner than that uh, because they don't want any contact with the system. So, you know, how can we persuade them to do that? Um, there's so many ways that these young people need support, um, and I think that there are some, you know, some civic organizations, some faith-based organizations that are trying to do everything from provide mentorship to laundry services to, um, you know, driver's ed courses to job training to transitional housing to going with them to an actual landlord and saying, like, you can trust this person. Um, I, I think we will make progress on this, but... I'm, I have not, I don't, it's really hard to solve this problem at the age of 18. Um, and, and so a lot of the book is really focused on how can we fix this sooner. One more question or? Naomi, thank you so much. I yeah. encourage everyone to read this book. It's so thorough, goes over uh, so much ground. And as we started uh, talking about some of the most hidden and neglected members of society. So thank you for bringing it to light. And thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you.